Okay, uh, what I'd like to do this afternoon is talk about money. Yes, money. Nobody's been talking about money so far. Have you noticed that? I noticed that. So I want to talk about money and uh, essentially as it applies to trying to balance cost and performance when using a cloud service. So let me um, begin by sort of framing the problem. Uh, I, maybe I, I could ask, I could ask, how many of you have had routinely performance problems that you could just throw capacity at until they went away? What? <laughs> okay, well, you're in the wrong room. I, ha I have bad news for you. Nothing I have to say is going to help you. You can just buy whatever you want and make the problem go away? Okay, this crowd is going to be unruly, I can tell. <laughs> now I'm worried. All right, well, the problem, which many of you don't have, is that if you throw capacity at a, at, 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 at a situation, at an application, typically performance, response time performance, that's one measure of performance, that improves, right? However, what happens if you throw capacity also, what happens is the cost goes up. And herein lies a, a conflict. And that's what I want to talk about today. So uh, in order to do that, in order to help you begin to look at how you might walk this type rope, what I want to do is go through a use case just to lend some concreteness to it. Uh, before I uh, talk about the use case, just let me say that the data is all real. The situations are real. The analytics are real. Uh, the company is totally fan fictional. And um, you know, all the data has been pretty much anonymized to protect the innocent. By the way, does anybody know who this is? Joe Friday, Joe Friday. thank you very much. Um, the last time I gave this talk, I, well, I typically always show this slide. And the last time I gave a talk and showed this slide, nobody recognized him. It was really bad. And so I was showing my age, I guess, because this was popular like in the 60s. Anyway, here's the company. It's called Custom Nails. And the founders of this company were dedicated to the proposition that nobody, nobody, man or woman, should ever go to a party without great nails. So they founded a website. They, 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 they put together a company. And of course, there's a usual cast of characters in a the company. There's a CEO who has the vision, the design sense, you know, the ability to make a real fashion statement with nails. And then you have the developers of the software, the, the, the ops guys, and the CFO. The CFO cares about Guess what? Money, right? So basically, the, the company started. It's founded. And what they need to do is build a website. So they designed sort of a conceptual website. And, and here it is. You know, they, they want to go with, into the cloud. And they want to take advantage of being able to expand and contract as the workload ebbs and flows. So that's the sort of conceptual diagram. And then they decide they're, gonna go, they're moving to AWS. And so here's the array of services as well as other, you know, anything that they can buy from AWS is pretty much on this slide. There's about 55 different services. So they make a decision, they design, they make a lot of decisions, they design the website, and these are the services that they decide to use. Everything's going fine. And two years pass, and this is what they see in the way of a bill. Slowly, inexorably, it's going up. Herein lies the problem. The balance, which was great at the beginning, is now starting to get unbalanced. The CFO is getting upset. Meanwhile, everybody else is trying to deal with that, it's particularly the people in, the, in, in DevOps. And the poor CEO who just wants really great nails, you know, he's trying to keep the balance. So, 
the situation is this, is, this is an out of balance situation, so what we need to do is really think creatively about this, think out of the block, you know, out of the box. Does anybody know what this means? Mater artium necessitas. <laughs> it's Latin. Necessity is the mother of invention. And we have a very necess you know, we're, we're in a state where we really need to look at the problem. So here's the, here's the path that uh, they started to take to try to solve the problem. The first thing they did was to look at the money. You know, what, where is the money going? What's it buying? Let, just look at the bill, basically. Then the next step was to look at, okay, I'm buying capacity and I'm buying services from AWS. Where is it being allocated? Next question is, well, where is it being allocated? Where, where, how is it being distributed? And is there a sort of a mismatch between how it's being utilized and, and, and you know, where it's being allocated? Um, one thing about AWS is they're happy to sell you capacity. It's up to you whether you decide to use it. You're going to pay for it whether or not you use it. Next. Workload distribution. What, what's the workload looking like? Is it ebbing and flowing? Is it constant? Is there, uh, you know, in, in a sense, what, what the company is trying to do is figure out, you know, about itself. You know, what's it, what, uh, what's it, what is it buying and what kinds of workload does it need to meet? And then finally, uh, look at pricing options. AWS has myriads of pricing options, and uh, I continue to be amazed at how complex they are. And we'll talk more about that. And finally, after you've gathered kind of all this information, then the next step is to try to look at some ways of modeling what you're doing and come up with strategies for saving money. And when you can do that, you get to the finish line and the CFO is your friend, hopefully. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We'll just trace the path of what this company did to try to get back in balance with the CFO. So, Here's their bill. It's as of May, so it's a recent bill. So looking at this bill, it's all color-coded, okay? And you can tell, if you look very closely, that the EC2 costs, which are the sort of greenish and, and yellowish bands, they reflect about 69% of their bill. So that's good in a sense because it tells you where you should look. Where is the so-called low-hanging fruit. Okay, if we look at the EC, EC2 expenses, maybe that will be uh, a good place to start to figure out where we can save, save money. So now we've decided we're going to look at EC2s. Well, how are they being used? Take a look at the sort of inventory. Well, it looks like the application is taking up the most of the EC2s, so we should probably look at the application. Uh, the application, it's a web application. Uh, they're using auto scaling groups and ELBs that are fronting them. Uh, they kind of look like this. So you have an elastic load balancer, you have a collection of EC2s that are in an auto scaling group, and you have a lot of information about it. Here's stuff that you can just get from CloudWatch, which is a minimal at best. But uh, this, is a good, this is a good amount of information. You can use this to do some modeling. And uh, finally, of course, you have, from the AWS bill, you know exactly what you're paying for each one of those EC2s, the ELB, and, and, and you, can, you can begin to associate workload with cost at this point, okay? All right, so now we're looking at ASGs. We're narrowing it down, slowly but surely. So now let's see how the ASGs are being util utilized and what, they're, what the cost is. So this is the beginnings of a model. It's really a pretty simple model. All we did was just take data that uh, comes from the, from the AWS billing files that sit on an S3, and you can sign up for them, and they get updated every hour. So we took that, and then we took, um, in this case, we just took CPU utilization. So let me explain this. Uh, what, what's, what's along the x-axis are uh, all the uh, microservices, or I'm sorry, all the ASGs that exist in the organization, and they've been cleverly named with letters. Uh, the height of the bar is the cost in May of this, each, each of the ASGs. So we have one bar for each ASG, 
and then the black line uh, is based, it, it, it's scaled on the other axis, the utilization, the, the one on the uh, right. And what you can see here pretty readily is that we have uh, one, one service that's costing us a lot, but is really heavily utilized. So it sounds, to, uh, you know, it sounds like we're allocating capacity where it needs to be in this particular case. But if you look at, at the ASG that's labeled C, you can see it's the third most expensive ASG that we have, and the utilization appears to be less than 20%. So just from this graph, you kind of know where to look. This ASG maybe could use some tuning. So let's see where to go from there. Well, with ASGs, you're supposed to be able to expand and contract an ASG you know, depending upon its workload. So let's look at what we're doing with this ASG. And this was what the ASG looks like. Each little uh, green square is an EC2. And the y-axis is showing how many ASG nodes we have. The x-axis is showing time and hours. So I've just plotted what, how I'm using this ASG over some number of hours. Uh, okay, uh, we're not doing much scaling up and down here, that's clear. Uh, if I look at the workload on the other hand, what, what's happened is this company has decided, look, I don't want to worry about scaling up and down. I want to look at the maximum workload that I ever see and make sure that I can always maintain a response time of less than three seconds. And in order to do that, what I've discovered experimentally by just adding ESGs is that it takes about 11 nodes. So what I've, I've done is I've designed this ASG to meet the maximum work, workload uh, and I'm leaving the workload, I'm, I'm leaving the, the, the configuration of it the same 24 by 7. Uh, I mean, it seems like kind of an obvious thing not to do, but you'd be surprised how many people do it. So, if you begin to get ex explicit about what it is that you're measuring in the way of workload, it's, it's maximum requests per second. Uh, let's, let's look at how that actually looks. If you look at the CloudWatch, um, CloudWatch metric, it looks more like this, which is certainly anything but a flat line, right? Okay. Duly noted. Let's move on to pricing. Okay. In the world of ASG, uh, world of, I should say, of AWS, there are really four main factors that determine what you pay for an EC2 whether it's in an ASG or not. Uh, first is the location. I'm not sure we really want to move the location of our EC2s, so let's just sort of rule that out. Uh, next is the operating system that we're using. I don't think we're going to switch operating systems. That wouldn't seem to be a very stabilizing thing to do, so we can rule that out. OK, how about the instance type? Well, that can be a huge influence on price. So let's just take, let's take a look at this, just briefly. Uh, I, I um, got all this data from uh, AWS uh, in late May. And as of late May, assuming that you've already decided on where you want to put your EC2s, and uh, assuming you've already settled on the operating system you want to use, this is the number of options that you have to choose from. This is how many SKUs there are. Uh, like there's 39 SKUs available for you to order in Seoul that run on Linux, that, that they use Linux. It's complicated. A lot of choices. OK, that's, that's noteworthy, but look, that's pretty complicated. So let's just say that we're going to stick with what we have. We're in US East. We have M3 Larges. We're running Linux, and it's May. Let's, we'll, call, we'll fix that and see what we can do with pricing. It's the one remaining thing. There are various pricing options that exist in AWS, right? And the pricing options are complicated. I've, I've tried to boil them down into this one table here. Uh, the first column is just the feature. That's sort of the most prevalent feature of uh, that particular pricing scheme. 
Uh, we have three pricing schemes generally. I mean, there's, the, you can, these all have subcategories. And uh, AWS is introducing new subcategories all the time. We have three, three columns, on-demand, reserved, and spot, basically. On-demand represents essentially the very low-risk, high-cost option. If you want an on-demand EC2, you can get it and you can keep it as long as you want it. Uh, nobody's going to take it away from you. If you look at the reserved option, uh, you can pay in advance, and you can know you, have the, um, know you have the EC2 for however long you've paid for, one year or three years. Uh, some, in some cases, you don't have to pay for, for it in advance. Uh, but uh, it's also a very low, very low risk option. The third case is spots. And that is a, in my opinion, a deep, dark black hole. AWS can pretty much take it away from you anytime they want to without any really auditing. I mean, you just don't know why. Uh, what they say is, is that if what you paid for it uh, becomes less than what people are willing to bid for it, then they can take it away and give it to the guy who's willing to pay more for it. So there's a fair amount of risk associated with the spot market. OK, so now what we've done is we've gathered information about ourselves. We've gathered information about the pricing options that AWS provides. Let's start applying some models to see what we can do to reduce cost for this particular ASG. And then the theoretically, by extension, you could do it for other ASGs. OK, so the first thing we can do is leverage pricing options. And here's, here's a very simple, simple model. There are the two, two of the options that are metered, so to speak, that are dependent on how many hours you use are the spot market and on demand. So what I'm showing here is you can see that on demand, if you look at the x-axis, uh, ranges uh, over instance hours consumed. So that's if I use one EC2 for one hour, that's one instance hour. If I use it for two hours, it's two instance hours, right? So uh, as those instance hours increase, the price increases. What you have to pay increases along with that for each EC2. This is for one EC2. And what I'm, what I'm uh, showing here is the cost um, for a week, OK? And the various uh, you know, horizontal lines, those are showing what it would cost if you bought a reserved instance. And so there's sort of a point of diminishing returns here with on-demand. For a while, if it is less than half a week, you can probably get away with a cheaper bill than buying something, say, buying a three-year uh, reserved instance all up front. So there, there are trade-offs in, in picking reserved instances or, or, uh, or you know, on-demand. Same is true of spot. The interesting, the interesting thing about spot is you can see I'm, I'm using a price here that I got you know, from the spot market. It's, again, it's real data. <laughs> However, I decided at one point to just test the hypothesis that a spot is always cheaper than an, an on-demand instance of an EC2. It's not. Believe it or not, in some cases, you can end up spending more for a spot instance of an EC2, which is you know, really less valuable in some respects. So spots are really uh, they're very erratic. So OK, so this is telling us something that you know, we're, we're you know, volume-centric. So um, looking at this, does anything suggest itself? <laughs> what, we, what should we do? How, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you can see that almost no matter what time of day, at least two EC2s, the, the workload is, is, is enough that we need two EC2s. Evidently, people are buying great nails, you know, 24 by 7. Not very, it's a little bit seasonal, I guess. One of the things that's interesting is, as you, as, if you look at some of this, this is real data, um, uh, and you can see that the peaks kind of all have the same shape, all have the same height. Uh, they're not regularly spaced. That's the only thing that's interesting. So it's, strictly speaking, it's not kind of a regular seasonal pattern. But there is, there are, there's, the shapes are pretty consistent. And that, if, if with, with some analytics, you could recognize the beginning of a shape, potentially. And knowing that, 
scale up as fast as you need to scale up or scale down, know when about you should start scaling down, just based upon recognition of the shape, which is something that's uh, very interesting to look at. So anyway, what you can end up doing, though, is buying the reserved instances. And so now you have a picture that looks like this. Okay. All right, well, what next? Another thing we could do is we could leverage scaling. OK, clearly we have some opportunities to do that. If you, look, if you go back, you know, all of the places where the, the, you don't have the peaks, there's, you know, all of those green boxes potentially could, they're, they're idle. We could just not pay for them. We just got to figure out how to do that. So let's leverage scaling. And one way to do that is to look at models. This is not new art, but this is called the MMC queuing model. And what it is is a model that allows one to take certain measurements and then predict what response time, or what really predict the number of nodes that you need in the ASG under the constraint that you want to keep response time under three seconds. OK, so here, here's uh, some of the inputs to the model, some of the assumptions about the model. Uh, there are other versions of queuing models that don't have quite so many assumptions, but this is classic stuff. Uh, there are uh, packages off the shelf where you can run these models. You can run them offline and, uh, and then use the information from the models to make a decision based on, uh, based on the arrival rate of the workload coming in you can make uh, predictions as to how many nodes you need. So uh, the, only, the only assumption that's really uh, obviously bad is that the buffer, a queue, the queue buffers are infinite. That's clearly not true, but it's close enough. <laughs> OK, so having identified this model and having looked at the assumptions associated with the model, all of which are very testable, because you can gather all this information. You could look at your arrival rate and see if it, it follows a Poisson distribution. There are statistical tests that can give you confidence that it's a good fit, all that kind of stuff you can do. So now, assuming you're going to apply this model, these are the equations for it. Uh, there's an R library you can get that implements this, and I ended up creating in about 15 minutes uh, a model that I could implement. And here is, is one way to sort of visualize the results of a few runs of this model. So what's, what's across the, the uh, x-axis is arrival rate. And that, that's something that we can get from, uh, from the ELB you know, every minute if we want it. So given an arrival rate, then, uh, and given a number of nodes, that's what the, all these curvy lines are, then you can project what the response time will be. That's what this model will do. And you can see that uh, it's kind of classic queuing result is that there's a knee in the curve, and if you go above the knee, you know, suddenly things go south really fast in terms of response time. So we have a constraint that we want the response time to be less than three seconds. So let's just say I have an arrival rate of uh, three jobs per, per second, then I probably ought to you know, if I want to keep the response time under three minutes, it's probably, sh I should have three or four nodes, something like that. Four would give me some headroom. But that's, that, I can read that off of this graph. Okay, all of these numbers, these, these are picked arbitrarily, I'll admit that. <laughs> but it just gives you an idea of what this model can tell you. So effectively what you're doing is you're saying, okay, I know what the service time is. I can, latency is a, is, a, is a value you can get from CloudWatch uh, for an ELB. So you can, you can get the average of that. Uh, uh, one, one interesting test is if the, if the average is roughly equal to the standard deviation, then you know it's uh, an exponential distribution, which is one of the assumptions that we had here. So, so you can test that pretty easily. And then uh, we have this constraint that response time is under three seconds. We're clear about that. So now what we can do is we can take an, we can, we can offline almost create uh, a map that says, OK, given an arrival rate of x, I should have this many nodes. And using historical information, I could even create a plan to say, OK, every Sunday, this is the plan every hour. That I, of how many nodes I should have on Sunday, and this, any other day of the week for that matter. So what you can do then is, is execute that plan. 
And if you do that, then what you get is a, a graph like this, and it looks like maybe, uh, maybe a third of the, of the little green blocks have gone away, and that means you've saved 33% of your, AS, your, your bill for this ASG, which will make your CFO happy. <coughs> Now, if you want, you can also, you know, do some more fancy stuff with uh, <coughs> spots if you want. Add some spots in there. And in the end, you know, you end up saving, uh, you know, money from all, from all three types of pricing. Uh, some tweaks that you can add are just parameters on the, on the sort of the, uh, the, the, the the, the algorithm I, I, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the, the loop, the control loop, and I, which I'm about to show you. But, th but this, is, this is just showing things that you can do to, uh, to, to either mitigate risk or be willing to take a little bit risk, of risk, make the, make the model sort of context sensitive. You know, how much risk can you take in, in, with respect to this ASG? So you can have a scale-in rate where you, you know, you're willing to just drop it immediately. That's what this is saying, unlimited. You could, you could say, I'm only going to scale in, uh, you know, one, one ASG, you know, one EA, EC2 per, you know, 15 minutes or something like that. Uh, same for scaling out. You can start earlier or later. These are all tweaks that allow you to sort of take risk more or less, right? And, you know, in the end, what you get is savings that comes from, you know, all your available pricing options as well as knowledge of your workload, which is using pretty much all the information you have. And to kind of add to it, I don't, I, some of you may have seen the presentation yesterday from Alan that, did, that talked about control theory. Okay, this is where the control theory would come in, is that what you can do is you can start off, this is, this is sort of a diagram, you start off with the, with the raw data coming in off of the ELB and the ASGs and all that, and it goes through the queuing model, so that's the model up at the top, and what you end up from the queuing model is you get a re recommended number of nodes, right? So the recommended number of nodes is then, uh, and, and uh, the recommended number of nodes is keeping the response time you know, equal to three seconds or less, and that feeds back into the cloud. You go, so, so one, of the, one of the things that can happen is, first of all, there's, there's, a, there's a block here that is looking at the current situation versus the recommended situation, right? And if it's different, then that can be fed back into the original model that then, you know, you just get a cycle. Now, what the, what could happen when, you, in, at this point, is where that, where that control logic could take place, where you, you implement the proportional integral derivative stuff that he was talking about, where you're deciding, hey, you know, I'm two nodes short. How many nodes should I add? So I add three, uh, maybe I add just two nodes. And then that, there's a resulting response time that happens. And if it's still too high, then the whole thing goes around again. That makes sense? So these are, these are, this is, this is uh, what, what, what we have implemented right now that we're working with customers on is the part where we're uh, basically just starting to do this manually. Okay, it's not automated yet. Nobody, nobody, and I wouldn't recommend that we necessarily trust doing this automatically right now. But after some experience and after some work with a lot of different ASGs under a lot of different circumstances, I think we're going to learn a lot. And this may be able to, to, to get fairly well, well automated in the future. At least that's our, that's our, our hope. Okay, so to sort of uh, wrap up, I guess. The main takeaways are that you know, AWS is happy to sell you capacity, and they will continue to sell it whether to you as long as you order it, whether you use it or not. So the key to try to achieve a balance between cost and performance is to know your own workload, know your own capacity and how it's being allocated, and leverage some models 
to figure out how it should be allocated if it's not, uh, not, not being allocated uh, sensibly. You can walk this tightrope. And even if there are cracks and you start to fall, cracks really aren't so bad. They let the light in. <laughs> That's it. That's uh, all for today. Thank you. I guess I should ask, are there questions? I don't know how late I am. Do you have questions? No, you're right on time. Is there questions? Okay. Warren, hi. <laughs> Yeah, th that, okay, the question, just to repeat the question, the question is how fast can you react? How fast is it even feasible? So once you decide you need to scale up two nodes, you know, how, how, how fast will AWS respond? And with spots, it's very risky. Um, one of the things that is interesting is just offering a SaaS service as we do. Uh, I think it is possible to get information from all the experiences that, that our tenants have in the, the delta in time between the request for an EC2 and the filling of that request for an EC2 on demand or spot, we may be able to develop some distributions to say, look, the probability of your getting this, an EC2 that's a M3 extra large in US East, the probability of getting it uh, you know, in less than two, two minutes is you know, 0 0.8. <laughs> So we could build, we could build you know, statistical distributions. But clearly, that's something that uh, will take some work to develop. And I, you know, I don't know. I, another thing I'm not at all sure about is uh, what the sensitivity is to response time to the reaction, you know, how long you have to, to wait to get something. So you can always scale up way early you know, and be ridiculous about it and still save money. Any other questions? Yes, it's been a long day, hasn't it? It's Saturday. Oh, there's a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. This model that you described, your the model you described, you're not currently implementing, but you're going to. We are. We have it implemented in beta. Okay. We are actively working with customers, and uh, it's looking good. But uh, you know, before you ever automate anything, uh, you know, one wants to be sure. Hi. Have you tried combining EC2 instances with like Lambda instances? Have I tried what? Have you tried combining EC2 instances with Lambda instances? No. <laughs> no, not yet. That's an obvious. What's so interesting about Lambda is just that you get to you get much finer granularity in terms of what you allocate. Is there so. A price difference as well? Pardon? Is there a nice price difference as well? Yes, there's a price difference. I, mean, I would assume there's a price difference. Uh, the lambda pricing would come out. I mean, the, the source, the data source is an AWS bill, and uh, what's beautiful about that's that it's the customer's AWS bill. So if they have some special deal, you know, we see a line item. There's one line item on for every hour in the bill uh, for whatever lambda stuff they did. So the the data, the good news is the data is available. Yeah. Okay, I, you already got a chance. <laughs> Warren's going to be trouble, I can tell. Yes? Have you by any chance peeked at the other cloud providers to see whether the same process or model? Yeah, yeah. I looked, we've, looked at, we've looked at some. The, the most experience we have is with AWS, though. But I, I did go and look at Google, for example. I have not looked at Azure or IBM or... Yes, I, okay, so the question is, would, would this process apply to any, any cloud provider? I think it applies to any, any structure. Another way of putting it is it applies to any structure that involves an ASG-like function, right? So yeah, I would, I would say it would. Uh, there may be some differences. A, a key will be how quickly an order gets filled, right? How quickly you can react. 
Okay, wow, that's a lot of questions. Okay, hi, yes. Forecasting? Yes, uh, yes, I mean, in effect, in effect, that's what you're doing. You're developing a function that given, given um, uh, service time and given arrival rate and given the number of nodes, what's my response time? So in a sense, uh, you know, that's, in a, that's, that's, a, that's a sort of forecasting function, really. Yeah, um, okay, that, that, that part of the analysis really is uh, what we do offline. So every night what we do is a run, and it's, it, it gives us a plan. Given historical data, we, are, we forecast if the past is prologue, which it isn't always, but if past is prologue, then we can say, okay, uh, we look at four weeks data back, four weeks back, and we say, okay, this is based on this data, uh, we expect tomorrow, and we actually, we, I think we, yeah, we do it for a week, so expect, we expect the next week to look like this. And, you know, we, you can adjust that. But it is a form of a forecast in the sense that we're saying, you know, set it up so that you're going to have this many nodes, and then if the feedback loop kind of takes care of the problem as if we're wrong, at least in theory, right? Okay, well, Warren had a question, I know. I don't want to, oh, hi. Um, now, I noticed that you look at Google a little bit, not others. I wonder how much would it affect the model based on the billing inputs? Because as I understand, AWS is pretty verbose and, and pretty uh, up to the minute per se. Is Google similar? And do you know anything about it? Together, how would that affect the model? Okay, okay, in a sense, what you're asking me is about the instrumentation, um, you know, and how, how Quickly, I get it, and you know what is what is it? What is the time lag between, uh, you know, having uh, a response to, or having no? Let's say, what's the lag between the system having workload arriving and I know about it, and me knowing about it? Yeah. And, and and the thing is, off, pardon? I guess we kind of round it off if it's instead of a minute by minute, it's a fifteen minute by fifteen minute increment. Yeah, I think that certainly that's less. I mean, it's then you're going to be less responsive, of course. But what, what is interesting to us, I guess, is that we're not necessarily limited to CloudWash. I mean, we, there are other, there's other sources of data. For, I mean, we have an agent, for example, and it can report things sub-minute if we want it to. So, uh, and the other thing that's interesting, I think, is that I was, all my examples are about CPU utilization because that's available from CloudWatch. A lot of the thing that's not available from CloudWatch is like the run queue length, uh, memory utilization, you know, if you have a memory bound uh, application, then you would not necessarily want to use CPU utilization. So, utilization. so uh, I would say, you know, you don't have to be limited by the cloud provider. You can put your own agents on there and, you know, get the information quite rapidly, much more rapidly. Rapid. Okay. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you.